But could you turn on the TV for me? Oh, nope, I think we got it. All right, um, Steve, could you raise the lights for me, please, brother? Uh, this week we are continuing in AC3 as we go into Deuteronomy as well, uh, and we'll finish up uh, Deuteronomy in three weeks. Uh, we are continuing to adjust the pace just a little bit. I know we went really fast through numbers, uh, so we will adjust that just slightly and have more breaks because I don't want your brains to be mush like my brain is mush. Uh, but we will get through Deuteronomy, then take a couple weeks off. Uh, but yeah, continue to pray for, oh, uh, if you see opportunities for the youth to come and, and do work, uh, yard work, things of that nature, projects that they could be a part of, please let us know uh, and pray about future events for the youth as well as we look to continue to pour into the youth at this church <clears throat> to be a blessing to them as they are the, the, the future, the next generation who are going to stand on the front lines with us. Deuteronomy chapter 7 continues in this address that Moses is giving. Now, Deuteronomy is broken into between three and five different addresses depending, depending on how, how a scholar likes to look at it. But we are in that full second address, if you will, if the first one is the historical prologue, where he is laying out the expectations of the law for the nation of Israel as they're on this eastern side of the Jordan. So today, I'm going to read just eight verses. And these eight verses are going to start this transition from what we've been studying for the past several weeks of who God is to now what he expects of his people. So I'm going to start reading in verse 1 down to verse 8, and we'll see where the Lord takes us today. When the Lord your God brings you into the land where you are entering to possess it and clears away many nations before you, the Hittites and the Girgashites and the Amorites and the Canaanites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites, Seven nations greater and stronger than you, and when the Lord your God delivers them before you and you defeat them, then you shall utterly destroy them. You shall make no covenant with them and show no favor to them. Furthermore, you shall not intermarry with them. You shall not give your daughters to their sons, nor shall you take their daughters for your sons, for they will turn your sons away from following me to serve other gods. Then the anger of the Lord will be kindled against you, and he will quickly destroy you. Thus you shall do to them. You shall tear down their altars and smash their sacred pillars and hew down their ashram and burn their graven images with fire. For you are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his own possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. The Lord did not set his love on you nor choose you because you are more in number than any of the people. For you are the fewest of all peoples. But because the Lord loved you, and kept the oath which he swore to your forefathers. The Lord brought you out by a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. The book of Deuteronomy as a whole is a brilliant book because it forms the handbook for how the people of God are to live their lives. What we then see in the rest of the Old Testament is how the principles of Deuteronomy are applied in real life. Deuteronomy is also interesting for another reason. It follows the general format for a treaty made between a people and a powerful king in order for this peaceful existence between the two. It has a beginning, a preamble, a historical prologue, general and specific terms to the treaty. That's what we're in right now. Then it closes up with this call to allegiance to the king, and that call to allegiance is demonstrated by obedience to the treaty. And last but not least, it includes the consequences for keeping or violating the treaty. We see this rough outline in the book of Deuteronomy. We will go back and forth between some of the elements, but overall we see that big arc. And we see that similarity between the two because the purpose of a treaty and the, book of the, uh, the purpose of the book of Deuteronomy, they have the same goal, to help define and protect a harmonious relationship between a people and their king. As we begin chapter 7, please keep in mind what we have studied to get here. We studied through the Ten Commandments. Those are the general commands that God is asking of them. That is then followed by the Shema, the declaration of who God is and why he can demand these things from them. And it couples with the understanding, it couples the understanding with the call to obedience that we saw at the end of chapter 6. 
What we will now see from this chapter all the way to chapter 9 is a single line of thought broken up into several component parts. The overall arc that God is telling them is this. You will not receive the blessings that you are going to receive because of you. You are going to receive the blessings because of me. You will receive blessings so vast and so profound that the rest of the world will stand in awe of you. And all I ask in all of this is that you don't forget who I am. Because if you do forget, if you forget who I am, then you will begin to wander from me. And I will no longer be able to bless you the way I want to bless you. That's the message. Now, it's not a small concept. It's actually a very big one, and it's the foundational understanding which holds up the covenant given through Moses. And when we look at what God is communicating to them, especially when we consider the very stern penalties that come with violating his will, we need to remember this. Where would we be without him? And I'm not just talking about eternal ideas. I'm not just talking about heaven or hell. I'm talking about right here, right now. Where would we be without him today if he wasn't our hope, if he wasn't our peace, if he wasn't our security and our grace and our life? Would we even have made it this far without him, or would life have already eaten us up? And that question is the question that Israel needs to keep before them. Where would we be without him? Would we be at this threshold, about to go into a land flowing with milk and honey? Or would we still be back in chains, living under an Egyptian whip? This concept adds clarity to what Israel, or God is asking of Israel then, and what he asks of us now. And what he gives us is not based on us. That's the guiding thought to all mercy and all grace. Grace is getting what you don't deserve, what you did not earn. Mercy is not getting what you do deserve. God is able to grant that mercy and grant that grace through the relationship that he makes possible with us. Even the relationship itself is not something that we could have created on our own. And God is going to teach this to Israel, starting in verse 1 in chapter 7, by showing them the dynamic through the lens of the people who are currently in the land. In verse 1, God describes a people in the land, and he points out at the end of verse 1, these nations are stronger than you. That's the starting point. Now, for the Bible student, that's interesting, particularly since we just went through the book of Numbers in AC3, because what God tells them here confirms the report of the unfaithful spies from number 13, because they came to the same conclusion. The people in the land are stronger than us. There's people there who are descendants of the Nephilim. There's giants in the land, and we are like grasshoppers compared to them. The problem back in Numbers 13 is not that they correctly identified the strength of the people in the land, and not that they correctly saw their own personal strength in the lens of this. God points that out too. The conclusion is the same in both places. The Israelites by themselves are too weak to take the land. We all agree on this. The great sin at Kadesh Barnea is what they allowed that understanding to encourage them to do, to rebel. To refuse. To see their God through the lens of the giants rather than the giants through the lens of their God. Therefore, after reminding Israel of the general terms of the covenant, the Ten Commandments are listed there. This is what I expect of you. After declaring that God, the God of Israel is God alone, and after the call of the nation to be obedient, he tells them, you know these nations that are stronger than you? I will deliver them before you. You will defeat them. And you won't defeat them by the strength of your arm, but based on the strength of your relationship with me. The command in verse 2 to utterly destroy the people who are already dwelling in the land is one that should give us pause. It is hard to harmonize this particular command with all the things we think we know about Jesus. Now, that statement itself is dangerous because it sure does cherry-pick a lot of what's going on in the New Testament, but for just a moment, it, it, we, we should expect like, something like this to be a little bit jarring to us. It seems like a harsh instructing, instruction, and it has become part of the harsh accusation against our God that the God of Israel commanded the Jews to exterminate the people in the land. 
And if you took just this verse, just this one phrase, that sure does look like that's what he's saying. And he's God. You know what he could say? I'm God, and I don't owe you an answer. Even though that is true, it's not unreasonable for us to ask, what does this command teach us about our God? How can God be love and command something like this? The word that is translated as destroyed in verse 2 appears about 51 times in the Old Testament. It's most often translated into English as destroyed, but the idea is more nuanced than that. We see this in Leviticus 27, 28, where the same Hebrew word appears twice. And it's translated two totally different ways. It's translated as both set apart and as destruction. And since those two phrases appear to be totally unrelated, we might be left to wonder well, what's going on. While the, world hold, or excuse me, the word holds the idea of destruction, it has this connotation around it, the word picture in Hebrew is that of a net. The idea is of capturing something or laying hold of something that has been devoted to a special purpose. And the context of the word is that that something has been devoted to doom. Now, I know how that sounds. But before I go on, please remember, the, the God of Israel has been patient with the people in the land who are currently living in the promised land for over 600 years. For over twice as long as our country has even existed, he has waited for the Canaanites to repent, and they refused. Instead, what they did was they threw themselves deeper into wickedness that was so terrible, it would be abhorrent to any people group in the world. And after 600 years of patience and mercy, the day has at last come when enough is enough. But even though I tell you that, there's a part of you, the rebel in you, still cries out. Because the idea of genocide is abhorrent to us for good reason because it's also abhorrent to God. It's not something that he declares lightly. And while there are times that God will say that an entire group must be judged, because the entire group was involved in sin, and we have discussed that, we see this numerous times within numbers. This is not one of those times. Instead, what we see in the book of Deuteronomy is a different dynamic, and it revolves around a more full application of the word that we see translated as destruction in verse 2. You see, the Hebrew word in verse 2 that is translated as destroyed also appears in Ezra chapter 8, and in that verse, its use there sheds light on our verse in Deuteronomy 7. The meaning becomes even more clear when we look at the battle instructions in Numbers 33. In Numbers 33, we see that God commands Israel, you are to go into the promised land and you're going to drive out the inhabitants. Not exterminate. Drive out. This becomes the, the central theme throughout the judgment. It becomes the first inkling of the battle instructions we're going to see later on in the book of Deuteronomy. And the central theme throughout this instruction is one of judgment. A judgment that falls upon the Canaanites when they're wicked and will fall upon Israel when they're wicked. With this understanding from Numbers 33, we can now go back to the instruction in Deuteronomy chapter 7 and find that the heart of God is not to kill the people in the land, but rather of severing their ties of possession to the land. This is why in Numbers 33, the instructions are not primarily against people. Yes, the people were to be driven out, but all of the actions or destructions are against places and things, not against people. You will destroy their idols. They're figured stones. Demolishing the high places, the places of false worship. This is repeated in Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 5. All of the actions in that verse are dealing against places, not people. You shall tear down their altars. You shall smash their sacred pillars. Cut down their asherah poles and burn their graven images with fire. All of those are places. They are the manifestations of a wicked heart. They are the things, the idols that bind you to wickedness within the land. And he says none of those things are to remain. And Christian, 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 pay attention to the instruction. He is saying make no provision for evil. It is this wickedness that is the reason that the Canaanites are going to lose possession of their land. It is their wickedness that will cut those ties that once bound them there. The concept is found in the definition for the word drive out that we discussed earlier in Numbers 33, 52. 
And it's part of the definition of it, that the possession of the land was directly connected to a person's relationship with God. It's part of the definition. We see this in Genesis 15 when God tells Abraham that he brought him out of his homeland in order to give him this land to possess. And the Hebrew word that is translated as possess in Genesis 15, 7 is the same word for drive out in Numbers 33. Therefore, what God is doing all the way back in Genesis 15 was describing a day when the people in the land would become so evil they would lose their right to possess it. And Because all the earth belongs to the Lord, it is his divine right to give that possession to someone else. Okay, I've given you a lot of supposition. Now here's my proof. My proof that it is not the heart of God to exterminate the people in the land. It is the plan of God to drive them out, to drive out those who refused to repent. But if those people in the land refuse to repent and they refuse to leave, then the destruction of verse 2 would apply. That's the thought. Here's my proof. In Deuteronomy chapter 20, God gives Israel the standards for war. This will become their battle instructions in full. He tells them if there is a city far away, right? So these are outside the borders of the promised land because he makes a distinction within it. There's the lands that are far away, the cities that are far away, and the cities that are in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. So if they're far away, they're outside of the borders of the promised land, if they want to make a covenant of peace with you, that's fine. But if they dwell in the land the Lord is giving you, you are not allowed to make a covenant of peace with them. If they will not leave, you will leave not alive. This is why in Joshua chapter 9, the Gibeonites who lived in the promised land, they disguised themselves as people who lived far away. When they came to Joshua and they asked to make a treaty of peace with them, they put on clothes that was all torn up and shoes that had holes in them, bread that was all moldy so they could say, it was fresh when we left the land that where we were, but now it's all hard and moldy because of how long it took us to reach you. Because they understood that God was not going to allow Israel to make a covenant of peace with people who were already in the land because it would allow them to continue as they were. What this communicates to us is not that God was placing upon Israel the responsibility to kill every person who followed these wicked ways. Because if it was, you could make covenant peace with no one whether they are in the promised land or not. What God was saying is that you must remove every last influence from your life that would cause you to sin against me. This is indicated by what God says in verse 4, that if you leave these influences in the land, they will cause your children to turn away from me. And it won't be you that deals with the consequences. It'll be your kids and your grandkids. Note where this this command comes in the sequence of the text. It comes after God has spent chapters reminding Israel of what he has done for them. God never comes and asks us to do for him before he tells us all the things that he's done for us. It is not that he's rubbing it in. It's so that we understand from this platform of gratitude what it is that he's asking of us. It comes after we've studied for the past several weeks, after we've seen God present himself as who he is, that he is the Lord and all of the earth belongs to him. And because of that foundation on which chapter 7 is built, the concept that the people were in the land lost their possession of the land, and they lost it because of their sin against him. This is why God, through Moses, pleads with Israel, do what I ask you to do. The law was never meant to be a burden to Israel. It was meant to protect them, to teach them the heart of God so that they could be obedient to God because the land that they were going to possess is not one that they could have taken on their own. Well, why not? Because of verse 1. Because it was occupied by seven nations, every one of them stronger than you. The command to destroy is followed by two caveats. One is found in verse 2, right? Specifically mentions you're not allowed to make covenants with the people in the land. The idea with that, as we alluded to before, is that they're not allowed to make it possible for the former inhabitants to stay in the land, to continue to dwell in the land, without first repenting and turning away from the wicked deeds of their heart. Verse 3 builds upon this. As verse 3 will mention the intermarriage between people groups that is not allowed. And this is why no one should be eager to go and be a pastor, because in just two verses, I go from one fire to the next one. 
Thankfully, this one is much easier to discuss than the last one because if you know the genealogy and the gospel of Jesus, then you know that God is not promoting any kind of social, or excuse me, racial purity. But rather, what he is telling Israel, only join with those who have the same spiritual values as you. We see the same instruction in the writings of Paul. When Paul tells Christians, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. What God understands and what he communicates through both Moses and Paul is that when a person who embraces God joins with a person who either hates God or is just indifferent to him, it's like that faithful person carrying around a heavy weight. Because of your strength, you might be able to carry that heavy weight for a while. But eventually, that weight will start to wear you down. And it'll wear you down and cause you to drift from God. It's a very, very hard truth, and few people want to hear it. From experience, I can tell you that this topic, along with cohabitation, are the two topics that are most likely to get someone to leave this church. It speaks to how God made us, with a desire for fellowship, a desire for relationship. But I have heard Christian after Christian tell me that they are strong enough to not wander away from God that they're strong enough to be close to God even though they're unequally yoked. And without fail, I have seen Christians on fire for God always slide in the direction of the partner who is not. Yes, there are wonderful stories of God using the Christian to save the one who is not, but it always takes a massive toll on the Christian, on the one who wants to be faithful. And I have yet to hear of a single example where the Christian did not first go through a season of compromising the truth before returning back to God. It's one of those stunning truths you only learn after you say, I do. That what a person is before they are married, they are more of after they are married. This is why God tells Israel in verse 4, do not join in marriage with the people who do not value the God that you serve. Because if you do, that will cause you to turn away from me. But please understand, we don't say this. The Bible doesn't say this to exclude. It says it to invite. God's heart for Israel is to demonstrate through Israel how good it is to be loved by the king and to ignite a hunger in those people who are watching Israel to worship the God that Israel worships. We see this later beautifully with Rahab in the book of Joshua. She is living inside of the land when she hears about what it is that God does for them. She says, my heart says he is the God to fear. And because of her awe of the king of kings, She, a Gentile woman living in the promised land, would become part of the genealogy of Jesus. That's the heart of God. This is why he chose Israel as his own possession, as his own people. Out of all the people on the earth, he chose them to be his. And when we consider the blessings that he has for Israel and the future he has for us, the logical question we need to ask is why did he choose them Why did he choose us? I'm sorry to burst your bubble. It's not because of them, and it's not because of you. This is a critically important aspect of our relationship with Jesus. If our relationship with Jesus was based on the awesomeness of us, then we would all be under this intense pressure to be wonderful all of the time. Because the second that we weren't, we would immediately begin to worry, well, is the love of God for me gone? The best analogy I have heard about this is to imagine that your salvation depended solely upon the finished work of Jesus, that, and you holding on to this watch. And as long as you held on to this watch, you were going to go to heaven. Now tell me, just how peaceful would your life be? It wouldn't be. You would check on that watch every moment of your life. You would have it locked up with chains to you to make sure that it would never go missing. You would wake up in the middle of the night just to make sure that that watch was still there. This would be the reality if the security of our salvation depended even in the slightest upon us. And it would go against the very heart of God that tells us, do not fear, for I am with you. Stop looking around anxiously, for I am your God. He is the one who strengthens us and helps us. He's the one who upholds us by his righteous right hand. So why did he choose us then? Because he did. 
because for some reason he loves us. And as an act of his will, he chose us. That's what this passage tells us. It starts with verse 1, but it goes down to verse 7 and 8. I didn't choose you because you were the biggest. In fact, all the nations in the land were better than you, bigger than you. And he didn't choose us because we were the best, because we can think of other people. Why didn't he choose them? My goodness, look at how awesome they are. But that's why it's called grace. It's getting what we don't deserve. It's getting what we didn't earn. And being his beloved, being called by his name, is not something we could ever earn. And because he is God, we don't ever have to worry about him changing his mind. Now, the fact that he won't change his mind doesn't mean we get to do whatever we want to do. As we will see throughout the book of Deuteronomy, there are consequences for going against the heart of God because it breaks the fellowship that he created for us. But verse 8 declares that our God never gives up on us. That's the point. I didn't choose you because of you. I chose you because of me. And because my heart is set upon you and I do not change, I will never, ever give up on you. He is the God who saved Israel when they were in bondage. He saved us when we were lost in sin. He is where our peace is found, and our peace is found in the beautiful truth that even when we are faithless, he remains faithful because he cannot deny himself. Father, we love you. Lord, there is absolutely no reason why you would choose a people like us. And yet you did. Such is your love that you did. Father, you give us the opportunity to make this decision, to come close to you, to cry out and say that you are our God. And besides you, there is no other. Father, thank you for the instructions in this passage. The harshness of them that first hits us, Lord, that sharpness causes us to pay attention, but then to see the beauty of your instruction to us. Make no provision for the flesh. Don't make it easy for your life to be wicked against me. Father, help us. We struggle. The struggle is so very real. But even when we fail, we know that your eye is ever for us. Your arms are desperate to hold us. That you stopped at nothing, even sending your son to make a way for us to go home. Father, we love you. We beg you, please be with us. Give us your grace and mercy. Forgive the frailty of your servant. I'm not worthy to speak your words. But may your Holy Spirit just sweep through this room and plant deep in our hearts what we need from you today. Lord, we love you. We trust only you. Please be with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Family, we will have one last song.